So good morning to Australia uh, and uh, welcome everybody to our seminar today. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Metro Tem. He's our today's speaker. It is 1.30 in Melbourne and I'm very thankful to Matt for accepting our invitation. It is great to have you here, Matt. So. Uh, Probably this is uh, the, the earliest, let's say, talk that you ever gave or, yeah. I mean, in Australia, yeah, probably there are more talks yeah, scheduled at such uh, crazy hours, I'd say. So uh, Matt received his uh, PhD in uh, mathematics in 2016 from the University of Newcastle under the supervision of uh, late Jonathan Borvine. And then he moved to Europe uh, on a postdoctoral position uh, to Göttingen, where he worked in, a, in the group of uh, Russell Luke. And after spending some, some time as a postdoc, then uh, yeah, he became junior professor on a permanent position yeah, in, in Göttingen, uh, which is uh, yeah, actually a great position in Europe. But then he decided to move back to Australia. And he is now affiliated with the University of Melbourne, which is another great place. He's a member of uh, the School of Mathematics and Statistics. He's a member of uh, the Center for Data Science. So he's uh, yeah, doing uh, yeah, many great things. Uh, so I guess uh, his current university is a, is a great place yeah, to work. And then Melbourne is, of course, a fantastic city. So Matt is working on uh, different topics, I would say, mainly on uh, operator splitting, yeah? but, but in particular on, on algorithms, but also on some uh, yeah, non convex methods or material quality. So he has a wide research profile. And today he will give a talk on minimal lifting, which is uh, another, let's say, hot topic yeah, in, um, in this field. So Matt, thank you for accepting our invitation. You have 45 minutes for your talk. Uh, thanks very much, Redu, for the introduction. Um, and thanks also to the other organizers, Shoham and Matthias, for organizing the seminar. Um, yeah, I don't usually get to attend the seminar in person, but I, I, I always watch the recording the day after. So it's, it's been really great over the last 18 months or so. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here today to talk about my work. Um, so in short, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, algorithms for solving monotone inclusions that use the resolvance of those operators. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some questions related to that. So um, the first part of my talk will just be a very short introduction um, I'm sure that most people probably know what I'm going to say in the first six slides or so. Um, if that's the case, then it's just an opportunity to um, give you a gentle kind of like um, give you a gentle introduction to the notation I'll be using. Um, and if you haven't seen it, then it's hopefully a quick introduction to the topic. Um, the reference for this talk is on archive. It's down the bottom there, and it's. Um, it's the paper is essentially the same name as the title of the talk, and it's joint work with Yuri Malitsky, um, who gave a talk in this uh, seminar series a few weeks ago. Okay, <clears throat> so um, first of all, a monotone operator. Um, everything that I'll be talking about today will be in a real Hilbert space, which I'll use H to denote. And um, uh, recall that uh, an operator B, which is potentially set value, uh, so it's from the Hilbert space back into the Hilbert space, is said to be monotone if you take um, two points in its graph and this inequality here holds, so that inner product is greater than zero. Um, and so what that means is that if you were to look at the bottom left picture, um, which is taken from the, the book of Bashkin and Kubets, by the way, um, the graph of this function is the line that moves, uh, is increasing as you go from left to right. So it's potentially set value to this point where it's, it's vertical, but it's increasing from left to right. That's what this inequality means. Uh, and then in addition to that, a monotone operator is said to be maxly monotone if there is no monotone operator whose graph properly contains uh, the graph of that operator. Or in other words, you can't extend the operator, you can't extend the graph of the operator without violating monotonicity. So if we looked at the, uh, the operator in the left picture there, so that's a monotone operator, but it's not maximally monotone because we can extend the graph by filling in that little gap in the top right corner 
And then we're going to get the picture on the right-hand side, which is an example of a, a monotone operator that's maximally monotone. Okay, and, and the basic problem for what we're talking about throughout this talk today is um, this one up here, which I'll call the N operator monotone inclusion. Um, and all we want to do there is we want to find a point in the space which is a zero of the sum of N maximally monotone operators. So A1 through to AN are all maximally monotone operators potentially set value. Um, so examples are not the main point of the talk today. Actually, we're more interested in the algorithmic side and what's possible with algorithms. But if you wanted some examples of, of this sort of problem to be concrete, um, you can take things where you have a, a finite sum of potentially non-smooth functions. So if you take um, the operators to be the sub-differentials of convex functions, then you can get uh, the minimization of, of convex functions with some, some rules and constraint qualifications, of course. Um, you can also consider minimax problems where you have a sum of functions which are convex in the first argument and concave in the second argument. Um, and you do that by taking, um, so you're trying to minimize with respect to the first variable. So you take the operator to be the partial subdifferential of the function with respect to the first variable where it's convex. And then you take the, sub, the partial um, subderivative with respect to the se second variable of minus the function because the function is concave, so minus the function is convex, where you're trying to maximize. Um, so there's just two examples, for instance. But like I said, the main focus for this talk is going to be on algorithms, not so much the problems. OK. Um, and the algorithms that we'll be interested in will be um, built up from algorithmic building blocks, which are the resolvents of the operators involved. And so just recall that the resolvent of a set valued operator is defined as the identity plus the operator inverse. And I'll just denote that by J sub the operator throughout this talk, which is the usual notation. Um, and when the operator is maximally monotone, the resolvent is a well-defined operator in the sense that it's single valued. So the inverse doesn't have to be single valued, but it is if it's maximally monotone. And in that case, you also have full domain. Okay, so armed with this resolvent, we can talk about um, a classical algorithm, the proximal point algorithm for solving this uh, monotone uh, inclusion when n equals one. So when there's just a single operator um, and the proximal point algorithm, I, I think most people here will be familiar with it. It goes back to the, the works of Martinet and Rockefeller and, and many other authors uh, since then. But here's the basic convergence result. So we have A1, which is our maximum monotone operator, and it has a zero. So we're assuming there is a point X such that zero is contained in A1 of X. Um, we choose any initial point in the space, and then we generate a sequence ZK. So I'm using superscripts for algorithm sequences, um, just by applying the resolvent at each step. And so then we generate a sequence of points. And what we can say then is that this sequence um, converges weakly to a point. So I'm using the, the right harpoon up arrow for weak convergence here. Um, it converges weakly to a point which is a fixed point of the operator, so of the resolvent. And that fixed point set is exactly the zeros of the operator A. So provided we can compute the resolvent, this provides us with an algorithm to solving the monotone inclusion when n equals one. Okay, how about, um, n equals two. So let's let's try the next most difficult case. Um, in one sense, you might say, well, I try and apply the proximal point algorithm and I'll just replace the operator A1 with the sum of two monotone operators. Um, you can do that sometimes, but most of the time it's not possible to compute the resolvent of the sum of two operators, uh, even if you know the resolvents of the individual operators themselves. So there's generally, in general, not a relationship between those. Um, but instead, we can use another algorithm, uh, which is Douglas Ratchford splitting. <coughs> um, and so here's the analogous convergence result for Douglas Ratchford splitting. We have two maximum monotone operators, A1 and A2. Uh, there's a zero in the sum of those two operators. We choose again any point in the space, and we generate a sequence by applying uh, this operator, the Douglas Ratchford operator, which um, is made up. If you have a look 
uh, at what this sort of iteration is made up of, you compute the resolving at points, you do vector scalar multiplication, um, and then that's essentially everything you do, right? So there's not that many operations, right? Or in vector addition, I should say as well, right? For instance, like here, you have to add the resolvent, which is a vector when you get the, the output of that to another vector. So you multiply here by a scalar, you add vectors together, and then you apply resolvent. So there's kind of three different steps that are in this algorithm. Um, and the result says that if you do this, then you get a sequence ZK, which converges to a fixed point of the Douglas Ratchet operator. And if you have a look at the um, shadow sequence, which is the resolvents applied to this sequence, said K, then that converges to a point which is a zero of the sum. Um, and we heard a lot more about this, this method um, just a few weeks ago in, in Wala's talk um, when she spoke about this in detail um, and the normal problem as well. Um, one thing I want to point out here with this, which is different to the previous um, algorithm, is that there's two different sequences that are involved here. So the first is that you have this operator that generates the sequence ZK, which is kind of the one that drives the algorithm, but it's not the sequence that solves the problem. So it's a sequence that you analyze convergence with when you look at the method, but it's not the sequence that solves the problem. Um, what you have to do is you then have to apply the resolvent of the first operator to get the, the solution sequence. Okay to get the thing you actually want, which is the, the zero of the, the sum of the two operators. Okay. All right, so we've seen n equals one, n equals two. Uh, what can you do with n equals three? And so far at the moment, everything I would say is kind of the uh, classical stuff, let's say, or the stuff that's, that's well known that most people may have seen before, I think. So for n equals three, um, we're gonna, just do the, the general case for n greater than three in one go. Um, so let me use this notation here. I'm gonna say that A is an n tuple of maximal monotone operators, by which I mean A1 is a maximum monotone operator from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space, A2 is as well, and all the way up to AN. Um, then what we can do is we can reformulate the problem of finding a zero in the sum of those operators as a two operator um, monotone inclusion with this n tuple operator and then the normal cone to the diagonal subspace, which is the, um, the set of n tuples of points in the Hilbert space such that all the coordinates are equal. And then what we've done is we've converted a monotone inclusion with n operators in the original space into a two operator monotone inclusion in a bigger space, an n-fold Cartesian product Hn. And so if we do this, then we have a method for solving the n operator monotone inclusion in the product space Hn, um, which involves computing the resolvents of the normal cone and of the, the monotone operator A. And we can do this because the resolvent of the n-tuple is the n-tuple of resolvents, and the resolvent of the normal cone is the projection onto the diagonal, which is just the average of the coordinates. Um, copied n times. So this is somehow seems like it might be the end of the story, um, but it's, it turns out it's not. So what we've done here is we've traded off, um, by, by using this reformulation, we've now had to solve the problem in a potentially larger space. So we now have an operator, the Douglas Ratchet operator here is working on the n-fold Cartesian product. And so, we want to start to think about what we can do in terms of reducing that space there. So it, we may not want to do it in the n fold Cartesian product because we have to use more memory to store those variables, to store those points. Can we do anything better? Can we define an algorithm that works on a smaller space but still solves the same problem? That's kind of the ultimate goal of where we'll be going with this, this talk. Okay, so um, yeah, just to put this in a few more words. So, uh, I would say like roughly speaking, most of the literature on operator splitting is devoted to, to trying to show what's possible, by which I mean, there's a lot of work which uh, developed algorithms to solving monotone inclusions and analyzes the convergence of, of new and um, existing algorithms for solving monotone inclusions. And generally the way things are set up, you kind of split algorithms up or you can group them together based on the properties of the operators of the problems they solve. So, 
It could be set valued operators. It could be there's some Lipschitz single valued operators. There's co-coercive operators, strongly monotone operators, or any combination of those things. Um, on the other hand, there's not so much work looking at what is not possible within this sort of framework. And, and what I mean by that is there's no statements like um, there exists no algorithm with the following properties. Um, now, if you want to make such a statement, you have to decide on some rules. You have to formalize some rules so you can say the, you know, the framework within your working. Um, and so the main goal of this talk will actually be the second category. So I want to try and show what's not possible, but I will do a little bit of what is possible along the way as well. Um, roughly speaking, the rules of, uh, that we will formalize, that, that we want to follow, are uh, we want to consider the class of fixed point algorithms which employ the resolvance of all of the monotone operators involved in the inclusion. Um, but I'll, I'll be a bit more formal in a moment. Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about the structure of resolvance splitting algorithms. And um, although I won't keep mentioning it throughout this section, a lot of the definitions um, in this section are, are taken from Ernest Rue's paper in math programming. Okay, <clears throat> so um, as before, I'm going to use this notation of A1 through to AN for an n-tuple of maximal monotone operators. And I'll use math cal N for the set of all such n-tuples of maximally monotone operators um, with n operators in it. Um, now, here's the first definition. It's a, a fixed point encoding. Um, and what this definition says is we have a pair of single valued operators. TA is an operator where here A refers to the n tuple of maximum monotone operators. SA is an operator. Um, and that's said to be a fixed point encoding for the class AN, which means n maximum monotone operators. If for any such um, n tuple of those monotone operators, we have the following two properties. Um, the first property is that the fixed points of the operator TA uh, exactly characterize when the sum of those operators have a zero. Um, and the second thing is that if you take a fixed point of this operator T and then you apply the second operator S to that point, then you get a, a zero of the sum. And so when thinking about this definition, it helps just to have a bit of context. Um, as I said on the bottom there, you should think about the fixed point operator as the basis of the iterative algorithm, right? So it has a fixed point and then you wanna use a fixed point to get a solution. Um, and so that's what property two is saying. It's saying if you apply this solution map to fixed points, then you get solutions of the problem you're trying to consider. Um, so this is just a statement at the moment about fixed points and solutions. Um, of course, we also want to have convergent algorithms. So in addition, we'll say fixed point encoding is convergent if this fixed point iteration converges to a fixed point for any starting point Z0, okay? Um, and I'm just going to call this convergent, even though in Rue's original paper, um, he uses the terminology unconditionally convergent for property three, by which he means um, you don't need any extra conditions for the uh, algorithm to converge. Okay, let me give just a few examples. So the first thing is, if we just have one monotone operator and considering A1, then the proximal point algorithm, which I showed you a moment ago, is a fixed point encoding. Um, the algorithmic operator, let's say, or the fixed point operator is just the resolvent of A1, and the solution operator is the identity, because it, it's the same sequence that converges to the solution. Matt, I have a question. Can you go, please, can you go back to yep. the previous slide, please? So, I mean, for the second property, uh, is there, a, is there a, let's say, a relevant situation where we have only the inclusion and not an equivalence? Uh, for property two. Yes. Uh, so property two just says, so the, what would the equivalence be in two? Because you only have the one direction. Right? Yeah, you, usually there is an equivalence between like fixed points and zeros. I mean, if you do it yeah, with, with a resolvent or, or so on. Ah, could you go back the other way? Um, yeah, I, I think that the answer is yes. Um, I mean, this is a question. Yeah. Is, it a, is it a, let's say, a relevant case where, it, we have, I mean, of course, this is a very abstract. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. 
notion, but uh, actually why, why to, and of course it's weaker to take it ju just in one direction, but uh, I, I guess that in, in the, yeah, most of the cases it is the equivalence there or should be an equivalence. Yeah, I think uh, at least in the cases which we will consider, like when we add a few more assumptions in a moment, it'll be an equivalence. In okay. general, I would not be totally sure, but maybe, okay. maybe it is. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the second one is that the Douglas Ratchford algorithm is a, a fixed point encoding for the two operator problem. Um, then we have TA is the Douglas Ratchford operator, and the solution map is the resolvent. Uh, we can also look at Douglas Ratchford splitting in the product space, and that's a fixed point encoding for the n operator problem. Then we have the fixed point operator is Douglas Ratchford applied in the product space, which we saw before. And the solution map is just the average of the coordinates. And all these examples are actually convergent fixed point encodings as well. So not just fixed point encodings, but convergent. Um, if you wanted just an example of a fixed point encoding, which is not convergent, it's a, it's a little bit constructed, I guess, but if you took something like the forward backward algorithm, it's not convergent because it requires the second operator to be co-coercive, right? And we need this to hold for all uh, pairs of maximally monotone operators. And actually it's even worse than that. It's not even a single valued operator in general with A2 is not single valued. So the definition required these algorithm algorithmic operators to be single value. So just as a kind of, yeah, except. Okay, so we're actually not just gonna look at fixed point encodings, but we need to add some more rules. Um, uh, and, and the rules which we wanna add are about the types of operations the operators can be defined by. Um, and so what we do is we're gonna say that a fixed point encoding is a resolvent splitting um, if, whenever I take one of these n tuples of maximum monotone operators, there is a procedure that evaluates TA and SA at a point. So you give me a Z and I compute TA of Z and it only uses three things. It uses vector addition, scalar multiplication and the resolvents of those operators, which we're looking at. Um, and so that's the uh, case with like the Douglas Ratchford algorithm that we saw already. Now, um, if at the moment we haven't said anything about how many times you can use those resolvents, but we're most interested in the case where you only use each of the resolvents exactly once, which was the case in all the algorithms we saw so far. Um, and if that's the case, then we'll say that a resolvent splitting is frugal. Okay, which just means the resolvents have to be used exactly once. Um, and they can't be used zero times because then it wouldn't contain any information about the problem you're solving. Okay, so what, what's the implications of this definition? The first is that you can provide a kind of canonical form for the operators T, A, and S, A in terms of some coefficients that arise when you do these vector additions and scalar multiplications. So there's a kind of canonical form, if you like, that you can represent them by. And just on an informal level, it kind of means that an operator, the operator TA can only become nonlinear through the resolvent steps in its evaluation. Okay. Okay, let me give some more examples. So all the fixed point encodings from the previous slide I show you are frugal uh, resolvent splittings. Uh, so there's examples already. If we wanted an example of a convergent fixed point encoding that's not a resolvent splitting, we can sort of apply the douglas ratchford algorithm instead of to two operators, we just apply it to the one operator problem. And then we would get something that looks like this, um, where we use the resolvent onto the operator of the operator A1 twice in the iteration. So it's not result, it's not frugal. Um, some other methods which don't fall into this class is um, methods that use projections onto separating hyperplanes um, as part of their iteration. Uh, so that includes Hagazel type methods, projective splitting, and many other methods. Um, and that's even though they use the resolvents, this uh, projection onto a hyperplane step, it isn't falling within the framework because it needs more than just um, vector addition, scalar multiplication in general. Um, some other examples which don't fall within this framework is an iteration where, in, in general, I, I mean here, 
where the resolvents are evaluated with different um, uh, scalars in front of the um, monotone operators there. So for different values of lambda one through to lambda n, there, um, they're not resolvent splittings under this definition. And that includes the parallel Douglas Ratchford with reduced dimension. Okay. Um, so just recall the second property that a fixed point encoding must satisfy. It was that if you take a fixed point of the algorithm operator and you apply the solution mapping, then you must get a zero of the sum of those operators. Um, and so the first result that I want to give you for this talk is that if you um, use this canonical form that I sort of taught, talked about that you, you have, you can actually specify what the solution map has to look like for frugal resolvent splittings. So here's the result. Um, it says that if we have a frugal resolvent splitting for the N operator problem, and you take a fixed point Z of the algorithm operator, and you let YI denote the point where when you compute um, these operators at the point Z, the resolvents have to be computed at some point. Let's call those points YI corresponding to the ith resolvent. Um, then we necessarily have that the solution map at Z can be expressed in any of the following ways. It's either the average of the points where the resolvents are evaluated, or it's just the output of any of the resolvents along the way. And so what this says is that if we want to consider this class of frugal resolvent splittings, uh, if you give me an operator TA, I can tell you what the solution map has to be, or at least what it has to be at the points where we care about it, which is the, the fixed points. And so that means in terms of trying to analyze these methods, we can ignore the solution map because we, we know it has to look like this. We can kind of focus on what the uh, algorithm operator looks like. Okay, um, here's the last definition, I think, for this uh, section that I want to give you, and it's the idea of lifting. Um, and basically, this is um, what we sort of saw with the Douglas Ratchford method applied to the product space, but in, in kind of a more general setup. So what we do is we have some integer or some natural number D, and we'll say that a fixed point encoding has default lifting for the N operator problem, if the, the algorithm operator is defined on the default Cartesian product space of the Hilbert space to uh, the same space, and the solution map then has to be defined on the default Cartesian product back to the Hilbert space. So for the case of Douglas Rashford applied to the product space, D would be equal to N here. Um, and so what we can kind of think of informally is that D represents the number of copies of variables we need to be able to use this operator TA. And so the smaller D is, the less memory we need, which is good. Um, and then we can start to talk about what, it, when, uh, what the smallest value of D would be. And we, we refer to those as the methods that have minimal lifting um, because they represent the algorithms that have the lowest memory requirements for this class of algorithms. So we're gonna turn our attention now to convergent so an algorithm that converges, it's frugal. It only uses the resolvents of each operator exactly once. Um, it's a frugal resolvent splitting. And we wanna uh, search for the minimal algorithms in this class, which means they have the smallest lifting of all algorithms. So the smallest value of D. Okay. Um, but before I do that, I'll just give you some, some more examples of lifting. So the proximal point algorithm would have one fold lifting, which is another way to say there is no lifting. The Douglas Ratchford algorithm for the two operator problem also has no lifting because the operator is just from H to H. And remember, we can ignore the solution map for the moment because we know what it has to look like. Um, Douglas Ratchford in the product space, as I said, has n fold lifting because we have to make n copies of the variables to do this product space thing. Um, and just one other ex example, if we took the primal dual hybrid gradient method for the two operator problem, um, it would look like the equation down the bottom here. And so that has two fold lifting for the two operator problem, right? So you, have, you need two copies of the variables. Um, it still uses each of the resolvents exactly once, and it still only uses scalar multiplication and vector addition. Okay. so. If we were just interested in the two operator problem now, we could see that 
Douglas fractured splitting would work with one fold lifting and the primal dual hybrid gradient method would work with two fold lifting. So among those two, one fold has to be minimal between those two, right? One is better than two in terms of lifting alone. Okay, so let's um, just use this notation. Let's use D star N to represent the minimal amount of lifting needed for a convergent frugal resolvent splitting. So this class of algorithms for the N operator problem. Now we know that we can apply Douglas Ratchet splitting to any number of operators and that that gives us N fold lifting. So we know immediately that D star N cannot be bigger than N for all N. Okay. So for the N operator problem, we definitely don't need more than N fold lifting. But can we do any better than that? Here's a summary of what the, the first few values of D star N are. So like we said, we have, it's equal to one. When, it's, when N is one, it's one because of the proximal point algorithm. When N is two, it's equal to one because of the Douglas Ratchford algorithm. And those two are necessarily minimal because it's one. Uh, so this one here is already better than n, right? It's, it's one instead of two. What about for n equal to three? Well, um, it turns out that in the same paper that I mentioned earlier, um, Rue discovered a, a splitting algorithm that's a frugal convergent resolvent splitting that only for three operators, for the three operator problem that only needs two-fold lifting. Um, and it looks like this. You have an operator TA, which is from H2 to H2. It takes as input a vector Z, which is in H2. Um, and then you have this combination here. You have X3 minus X1, X3 minus X2, where X1, X2, and X3 are the resolvents evaluated at different points. Um, and you can see that this iteration only uses each of the resolvents, computes the resolvents exactly once. It can use them more than once, but it only has to compute them once. The thing I want to point out here for the moment is that you have a three and a three if we just look at the first coordinates there, and then a one and a two down this side. Okay, so the algorithm would be the same as this. You would just put K superscripts above everything. And then the convergence result, um, which was originally in Ruiz's paper, but then extended to the infinite dimensional case uh, and including weak convergence of this um, solution sequence. Uh, by Fred Aragon, Ruben Campoy, and myself, as given here. So the sequence ZK converges weakly to a fixed point of the operator, and the X sequence converges to a point which is in the diagonal space, and then I take any coordinate of that and I get a zero of, of, of the sum of the three operators. And so this shows us that this would be a frugal resolvent splitting with one fold, uh, with two fold lifting for the three operator problem. So for D star three, we can say it's two due to Ruse splitting algorithm. Okay. Now, if we just have a look at those first few values, ignoring the first one, which is the proximal point algorithm, we might conjecture that the minimal amount of lifting for the N operator problem is N minus one, right? Because for N equal to two, we had one was the minimal value. For N equal to three, it was two. And if this pattern continues, then this is a reasonable conjecture to make. So D star N is equal to N minus one for, for N greater than two. Now, as a first step towards to trying to prove this conjecture, um, we were able to show the following result in our paper. Um, so it says that this would be the best possible case, essentially. So if I have a frugal resolvent splitting for the N operator problem, and it has default lifting, then D must necessarily be larger than N minus one. Okay. Um, and so what this means, a, a consequence of the theorem is that the D star of N either has to be equal to N minus one, or it has to be equal to N. There's only two different options here. Um, and so that are, then the question naturally arises is, do there actually exist any methods that obtain this N minus one fold lifting? Okay. Um, we know we can do N fold lifting, but can we do better? Um, and just, some quick words on the proof of this result. So it, it uses the rank nullity theorem applied to this, the coefficient matrix in this canonical form that I was talking about for the, for the operator T. And, and like I said, we don't need to consider 
the solution map because we already know what it looks like because of the proposition I showed you. Okay, so let's now go to that question that I, I just raised in the previous slide. So we know that we can do n-fold lifting for n operators. We know we can't do better than n minus one fold lifting, but we don't know we can actually do n minus one fold lifting. Um, so let's see if we can actually do it. Um, now, the first thing you might think to do is try and extend Roux splitting algorithm from n equals three to n equals four. And then if that works, then go for all uh, n greater than four as well. And that's what we tried to do. So I've written here Roux splitting algorithm for three operators, but I've relabeled this, the third operator as operator four. Okay. So this is what it looked like on the previous slide. Um, and so if you try and modify this, um, as best as we could tell, you have to do something like this. So the red stuff there represents the fourth operator that gets added in when you try and extend this scheme. And so you get an operator now that has threefold lifting. It's frugal because you have each of the resolvents computed exactly once. You only, you're fixed point encoding because you only, uh, sorry, you're resolvent splitting because you only do vector addition and scalar multiplication. The question then is, does it converge? And um, there are some other good things that are going on as well. So example, for example, if you take a fixed point of this operator, then the points x, x1, x2, x3, x4, which are where the resolvents, the output of the resolvents are, they're all equal to each other. I think that's quite easy to see, right? Because if this tz was z, then they just, these two z's would cancel out and you would have x4 equals x1, x4 equals x2, x4 equals x3. Um, and you can show that those points would be a zero of the sum of those operators just by rearranging the resolvent identities. Um, however, it doesn't converge for all um, uh, maximum monotone operators uh, or, or four topples of, of maximum monotone operators. In fact, if you try and prove convergence of this method, it turns out what you need is you need the operator A4 to be one strongly monotone for it to work. Um, so that doesn't quite fit our definition, but at least with some strong monotonicity, it's possible. Okay, so we need instead to try and search for something a bit different. Um, and how can we go about that? Well, um, let me just introduce a bit of notation here. So I'm gonna look at n-fold lifting. So I'm gonna use bold face z to mean a n minus one tuple of vectors, z1 through to z, zn minus one. Um, and then I'm gonna take two other vectors, which are gonna be n tuples, so x and y. Um, and so roughly speaking, what we could do is to try and find a new resolvent splitting, a new frugal resolvent splitting, we could consider candidate algorithms that have the form shown in the box here. So I have, I'm gonna assume that the operator T A of Z can be expressed as Z plus some step size gamma multiplied by some matrix M uh, multiplied by X, okay? So if X is, um, uh, sorry, this should be HN up here, not just H, right? So X is, a, is, is in HN, Z is in HN minus one. So that means M, the matrix M has to be N minus one by N in order for all the dimensions to, to match up. Um, and I'm gonna assume that inspired by the previous slide, that the X's are given by the resolvents evaluated at some points, YI. And I'm gonna figure out what YI need to be later on. But just as a general form, I'm going to just limit myself to algorithms that, that have this kind of form. Now, if I do this, then I can start to think about what the properties of this matrix M have to be in order to get something that's gonna be useful. So the first thing is that if I assume this is a frugal resolvent splitting and we have this form, then I can see that um, Z is a fixed point of T exactly when X is in the kernel of the matrix M, right? Because if, if Z is a fixed point, again, these would cancel and I would have zero equals gamma times MX, okay? So in other words, there's a relationship between fixed points of T and whatever this matrix M looks like. And then on the other hand, I would also like to have the property that if um, X is in the kernel of M, then I would like all those 
uh, coordinates of x, so x1 through to xn to be equal, and I'll call that point x star. Right? And we kind of know this has to be the case because we know from the solution map proposition that all the resolvents had to match up, right? If I just go back very quickly, we know that the solution map has to be equal to the resolvents evaluated at those points, right? So resolvent one at Y1, resolvent N at YN. And that's what we have here, right? So we have resolvent I at YI and that gives us X. So this is saying that all the resolvents have to match up. So we kind of know that this has to happen. Um, so that tells us one thing we can do. We just have to choose a matrix M that has these two properties at least. Okay, and this is just a question in linear algebra at the moment. Um, there are many options for matrices that have that property. After we've chosen such an M, we need to investigate what the appropriate expression for these vector Y I's should be. Um, and we can also limit the search a little bit by looking at the properties that we've already deduced. So for instance, if we know that X star is a solution, then the other part of the proposition, solution map proposition tells us that X star has to be equal to the average of the YI stars, right? Where the Y stars are the, the Ys that you get when you evaluate this operator T at the point, say Z star, right? Which is a, the corresponding fixed point. Um, the other thing we know is that the Ys must be a linear combination, let's say of the points which you've already computed because we're allowed to do vector addition and scalar multiplication. And so that means that when we compute yi, if we assume that the resolvent one through to i minus one are being computed, then we know what x1 through to xi minus one are. And we have from the input of the operator t, we have z1 through to zn minus one. And so that means yi must be a linear combination of those points. But just to put it briefly, it's, it's a linear combination of the points that we've already computed when trying to evaluate the operator at the current point. And then on top of all that, we have to do this in a way that, that um, the resulting fixed point iteration converges. So there's gonna be some trial and error here, of course, like um, I don't think it can be completely systematic, but at least we're able to kind of limit down what might be possible um, or where we should try and look for a method that has N minus one uh, fold lifting. Okay, so if you do all that, then here's the method that we propose. <clears throat> so um, what we do is it looks a little bit like Roos splitting algorithm before. Um, we define this operator TA on the N minus one uh, fold Cartesian product, and it's given by this expression here. The main difference I want to point out with this um, expression here is that instead of having before where we had in the first coordinate for three operators, we had X3 minus X1, X3 minus x2, right? It was always on the left-hand side, it was always x3, x3. Um, in our operator here, we have x2, x3, all the way down to xn, and in the first coordinate, we have x1 down to xn minus one, right? So the first part there is not staying fixed, it's always sort of moving, moving through, right? And this corresponds to choosing a different matrix M in this design criteria from the previous slide. Uh, in terms of the expressions for the resolvents and for the yi's, they're given by this expression down here. So x1 and xn have uh, their own expressions, but then all the resolvents in between are given by the same formula. Um, and this is, this is what it looks like. So this is the method which we're going to propose to analyze in a moment. And just a few quick comments. So if you take n equals two, um, the second line disappears in the xi expression, you just have x1 and xn, and you can simplify things a little bit and you get um, Douglas Ratchford applied to the operators a1 and a2. So in the two operator case, this is the same as Douglas Ratchford. And in the three operator cases, it's different to Roux splitting because of the reasons I already explained. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the properties of this operator TA. Um, the first is about the fixed point set of the operator. So um, we have all the properties which we would like. So um, we have, first of all, that the fixed point set of this operator is non-empty exactly when the sum 
of the operators have a zero, which was the first property of a fixed point encoding. And we also have that if we take a fixed point of this operator, then the point X, which is given by the resolvents, um, which are computed on the previous slide. So these, these resolvents are just the resolvents at the bottom of the previous slide, is a zero of the sum of the operators. Um, right? So it, it tells me if I want to now try and define a solution map, here's my fixed point Z. Well, the solution map X can be just taken to be this first resolvent here. Right? And so that's what I'm, I'm summarizing down the bottom. Right? So this is essentially saying this is a fixed point encoding for the n operator problem, and this is how to choose the solution. It's just the resolvent of the first product coordinate of the, the sequence ZK. Haven't said anything about weak convergence, um, but it turns out that this operator is actually non-expansive as well. Um, and so we have this kind of expression here. Um, it's actually, yeah, okay, so, so, we, so we have, first of all, it's not expansive, right? If we just look at the distance between two points, Z and Z bar, then the operator applied to those points is, the distance between those two things is less than the distance between Z and Z bar. But in fact, if you have a look at this second term here and you're familiar with it, you'll see that um, if you ignore the third term in red there, which is a norm, so it's positive, then you exactly see that this operator is alpha average non-expansive when alpha is, uh, sorry, gamma average non-expansive when gamma is between zero and one, okay? So you can just ignore this red term completely and you would get that immediately. And that's where we're gonna deduce convergence from. Um, but this red term here is actually interesting because I think in the n greater than two case, it's very difficult to do anything with this term, but in the n equals two case, the red term is exactly equal to the second term. So they actually, n equals two something special happens and you can take gamma a bit larger, but in general, the red term, I'm not sure if it can be used in a useful way. Um, so I said that it's, it's average non-expansive when gamma is between zero and one. It turns out in general, when you have three or more operators, you can't take gamma equal to one um, and still have something that's average non-expansive. So we have a counter example in the paper for that. Uh, so the algorithm also wouldn't converge when gamma is one in general. Okay, so here's the fixed point algorithm that you, you end up getting. Right? So I've just rewritten everything from that previous slide that I show you with, with Ks on everything. And of course, ZK plus one is equal to the operator TA applied to, to ZK. Um, and here's the result, which we can prove. Uh, the result says that if we have two or more operators, and all those operators are maximally monotone, they have a zero in the sum, and the parameter gamma is between zero and one, which we need to get the average non-expansiveness from the previous slide. We choose any initial point Z naught from the N minus one fold Cartesian product. And then we generate two sequences, ZK and XK, according to the, the box above. Um, then the following two assertions hold, the driving sequence of the fixed point sequence ZK is weakly convergence to a fixed point of the operator. And then the sequence of resolvents or the outputs of the resolvents converges to a point of diagonal space. And that point is um, a zero of the sum of the operators. Okay. So in other words, this algorithm converges and satisfies all the properties. Um, just, I think I, I just wanna say a few more uh, finer points on this theorem. So first of all, um, you can then say like, can we add anything more than just maximal monotonicity? It turns out if you have all but one of the operators are uniformly monotone, then you can get strong convergence of the solution sequence. And it, it holds in the limiting case as well. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because if you apply peachman ratchford splitting, if you know what that is to uh, the product space, it requires all of the operators to be uniformly monotone, but we require all the operators except for one if we were to do that. Um, and there's also some recent work from out of Kelowna where they, they looked at this method applied to subspaces. So that's the case where the monotone operators are the normal cones to subspaces, and then you get strong convergence to um, a best approximation solution. Okay, but so back to the original problem which I asked before, 
the conjecture was this red box here. So what's the minimal amount of lifting um, for the n operator problem? We said it could be n minus one potentially, but it's definitely not bigger than n. Well, if we combine everything so far in this talk, then we have the following answer to this conjecture or resolution of this conjecture um, that says, if n is bigger than two, there exists a convergent frugal resolvent splitting for the n operator problem with n minus one fold lifting. And that's the minimum amount of lifting possible for the n operator problem. Um, algorithmic consequences. Um, so it means that in general, you actually can't do too much better than the product space formulation, um, n-fold lifting versus n minus one fold lifting. Um, for small n, the difference between n and n minus one might be more significant. For large n, it might become less significant. Um, okay, so just to sum things up then. Um, so in my talk today, I showed that the minimal amount of lifting for the n operator uh, inclusion for these methods is n minus one. And then we discovered this new n operator resolvent splitting method that attains this minimal amount of lifting that is a generalization of the douglas Ratchford method. Um, I think there's a lot of questions here for future work. So for instance, lots of questions about finer properties of this new splitting algorithm applied to inconsistent problem, problems, for instance. Um, a question that I think Heinz Bauschke raised a few weeks ago in one of the discussions from this seminar was about how does frugality affect the amount of lifting needed? So is there a trade-off? If you allow the resolvents to be evaluated twice per iteration, can you further reduce the amount of lifting below n minus one, for instance? So a trade-off between computation and the amount of memory. And um, yeah, maybe it's also possible to now try and think about characterizing convergent frugal resolvent splittings for n operators. So, you know, some kind of table like this where you have a you know, a number of operators, the minimal amount of lifting and the algorithms that can um, work for that. Maybe kind of in the same way that in areas like finite group theory, you can kind of characterize all possible finite groups. Maybe we can characterize all possible algorithms in this class. Um, and just to sum up then, maybe we should sometimes focus a little bit more on not what is possible to prove, but what is not possible to prove. Okay, so thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Matt, for a very nice talk. They're very yeah, beautiful results and very clear presentation. Are there questions? So, Manuel, I see your raised hand. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for this very clear talk as already outlined by our chairman. So, can you help me with uh, to help my intuition uh, about this matrix M when you search for new methods? So basically, what you propose is to pass from an, an arrowhead matrix M to a banded matrix, right? Because the arrowhead was the X3 always on the left-hand side, as you phrased it, and, and you, you pass to a, a band matrix. Is this, yes, yes, does yes. this? Is this a general principle that it's more helpful, or what is the intuition behind it? I, that's, yeah, that's a... Great question. I have, I don't know if it's a general principle. Um, the way that we came to this matrix was we actually were, were trying to use the matrix that was in, in Ruse method originally. And it seemed like it was just not possible and we had to start searching for other things. So the answer is, I don't know, but maybe there is some deeper reason there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, and, and then uh, uh, given you have this slide open, um, still not completely clear, the description of the why is not some, I'm sorry, is, is, should, I should phrase it more positively. It doesn't seem to me that it is sort of axiomatic. So I cannot, from these three points, I cannot figure out the general position of the yi's given an iterate xi. Of course, if I already am at the fixed point, it's sort of clear, but what, what could I infer from these three rules about construction yeah, okay. of YI? So what four tells you is that YI is a linear combination of those other points, but the thing that I didn't write here that actually has to be true 
is that it's not, a, a, the linear combination cannot depend on the value of Z1 through to Zn or X1 through to Xi. So it's the coefficients in that linear combination have to be true, the same coefficients for all points that you would use. Fixed across iterations, right? Fixed across iterations, uh, okay. fixed across everything, okay. yeah. Okay, so you, you cannot write it just, no, you cannot write it just as a linear mapping from Z. Of course not. You can't write as a linear map because, because of because the, of the because, because of the resolvent. Exactly. But is it yeah. is it is it of the form linear? Then concatenation with the resolving concatenation with another linear, right? So it's somehow a hidden layer. the The resolvent mapping is playing the role of a hidden layer, if I may. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah, so I, I think also what you're kind of touching on is what I, what I said previously as well, which was that informally it also means that the nonlinearities in the algorithm have to arise through the resolvents. Yes, uh, okay, anyway, so. great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. Are there other questions? Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, uh, yes. Thanks for the great talk. So I, I have a question. Um, so here in, in, in this slide 24, you lay out um, um, sort of the, 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 sort of, uh, the minimal conditions on what M and you know, M should satisfy and, and, and also what Y should satisfy, satisfy. But then in the next slide, you present the algorithm, uh, the general algorithm that works. So how did you, and, and that sort of, uh, um, that step was not clear. To, to me as to how you, uh, uh, or so, so how from this step, from, from slide 24, you were able to find mm -hmm. the algorithm. Um, could you uh, share sort of generally how you went, you know, went about it uh, in, in the search? Yeah, sure. So I, I think to sort of ex explain what we were doing. So we sort of set up this framework and then we were searching within that frame for something that would work. So. What we said is that, first of all, as a first test was, we said that the matrix M is going to have entries that are either plus one, minus one, or zero. And that the linear combination for the fourth point with the YIs is just going to contain plus one, minus one, or zero in the coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did kind of like an exhaustive search by trying lots of different options there to see what would work. Um, we, first of all, of course, we considered the four operator case, right? So, so we did some like trial and error with computation for the four operator case. And um, then we found something that includes this that was working. Then we looked at the structure of the, oh yeah, so, so by the way, you can see that all the coefficients in this slide here are either plus one, minus one, or zero when a, a term doesn't appear in a particular expression. Um, and then so once we had the four operator one, then we, just looked at the proof and we could sort of see how it would generalize to the N operator case. Uh, so there's kind of two steps, I guess. The first was we, we just restricted ourselves to plus one, minus one or zero entries, uh, and then restricted ourselves to the four operator problem and then tried to generalize from there. I see, thanks. Um, and, and so another question. But, so, and, and, um, may, may I ask a, a question? which is related to your work and to, to this work, I mean, uh, Matt, so you did this by hand since, if I'm not wrong, Ernest uh, obtained this scheme uh, by using some computer assisted uh, approach. Is this correct, Ernest? Um, so, okay, so um, the way I obtained my scheme was, um, so it, it, in, in my prior work, um, uh, there were, were sort of uh, a, a few parts, but the first part was to show that uh, Douglas factor splitting is, is in some sense the the only uh, uh, you know, frugal resolvent splitting method for the mm -hmm. two operator case, and then the initial goal that I set out was to characterize all possible three operator okay. splitting um, um, so res uh, frugal splitting methods, and um, I wasn't able to do so. So then I sort of impose additional conditions with the hope that if I impose many many conditions, I'll uh, somehow. Uh, find a set of requirements that will make a certain splitting method uh, unique. And the conditions were that the resolvents would need to use the same you know, unit scaling factor as uh, I did and as Matt and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ura has, has done. Um, and then I added a bunch of conditions just arbitrarily 
Um, and I tried to see whether the method would converge by plugging in some you know, linear, some special uh, just uh, quadratic uh, convex mm -hmm. functions. Um, and I did like some, a bunch of mathematical calculations and I arrived at one method. Um, and then I, I decided, okay, maybe I'll just try to prove this convergence in general. And I somehow, and it somehow worked out. So it was a very, it, it wasn't a very principled approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I added a lot of uh, sort of uh, um, unnecessary conditions and so, so somehow coincidentally stumbled on the method. So I wouldn't say the, 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 the my initial discovery was a computer. Well, it's it, it was assisted by Mathematica, but it wasn't a very principled approach. Okay. And because the approach so to, to to follow up with the, to, to to segue into my question, so because of that sort of non principled approach, um, I actually had the impression that the method that I presented in the paper was going to be the unique method under sort of certain conditions. I wasn't able to prove it, but I, I tried but failed to prove it. But it turned, but when I saw um, Matthews and Uraz, uh, so the, the methods presented today for the n equals three case, I was pleasantly surprised because I thought the algorithm was going to be unique under certain conditions, but this is another algorithm that satisfies the conditions that I have thought. So the algorithm is uh, under the conditions, it was, it's not unique. So. Um, so, so yeah, I, I wanted to ask uh, Matt, so um, do you think there are going to be other methods for, let's to, to simplify for the n equals three case? And did you in particular try to find some sort of interpolation between my method and, and the method you guys have found? Yeah, that's obviously a, a natural question to ask about if there are other methods. Um, we didn't try any of the things that you mentioned about like trying to find a natural interpolation or trying to see if there are any other methods. Um, but I guess one interesting thing there would be, okay, so you've showed that for two operators, Douglas Ratchford is the unique method up to some equivalence. Mm -hmm. For three operators, there's at least two methods that we know of, and maybe there are others as well. Um, if there are no others, maybe then for four operators, there's three methods, say, or something like that. You know, like it seems like the, the more operators are involved, maybe there are more methods that are not equivalent to each other. Um, I'm not really sure how to address that in a more systematic way in terms of finding those sort of things, I guess. Um, like I said here, like even in what we did, we were just considering the case where we had plus one, minus one, or zero. You could also look for two, say, in that two minus two plus one minus one and zero. And there will be many options that uh, would be possible there. Um, I think the other interesting thing about your method as well though, is that if, if you try and extend it to four operators, then you need the strong monotonicity in one of the operators for it to converge. Um, maybe there are also other ways to extend that to a four operator problem that don't have that, that issue. But um, we tried pretty hard actually to try and do that. We weren't able to, to get over the strong monotonicity thing. But yeah, to go back to your, previous, your first part of your question, I'm not sure if there's a natural interpolation between the two. I see, I see, thanks. Um, one, one final question. So um, I just had this sort of, you know, okay, so I'm not that good at algebra, uh, you know, the abstract algebra, but um, maybe you are. Uh, have you thought of, do you think maybe, because it, it feels like algebra might be the right tool for these kind of classifications uh, type uh, approaches. Um, have you thought of using other sort of tools of algebra to, to uh, maybe abstract this problem further and uh, find some new breakthrough? Um, I, th I think it would be possible at least to try and look at the uh, like frugal resolvent splitting part um, in trying to, to do something there. I'm not sure how to handle the convergence uh, part of the answer. So maybe it would be possible to find new operators and, and algorithmic operators and, and things like that for which it would work. But then the convergence part, I don't really know a good way to do that other than ultimately showing it by hand. Right? And, and so like as well, this operator that I showed here was not expansive. The algorithm, the operator corresponds to your algorithm has a similar sort of property. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of other things where it doesn't have to be a non-expansive operator. You can still get something that converges. And I guess we haven't even started to think about those possibilities either. So I guess there could be some options there, but it still feels like quite a, uh, a big step there of, of things that would have to be figured out in order to go in that direction. I see, yeah, thank you.
You want to test? Are there other questions? So I have a question, Matt. So can okay, can you can I say it again? So so for gamma equal one, uh, the operator is uh, yep. not any more averaged. Yeah? But that's but right. Yeah. Sorry, I'll go start. Yes. But then uh, uh, then the sequence is not converging, or is it converging? No, no. So gamma has to be between zero and one, unless the operators are uniformly monotone or something, or you have something stronger. No, no. Of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But then, but then you get also okay. But then, then you get also uh, the okay rate of one over square root of k for the fixed point residual. This just for, this just comes with with the sure. property. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean yes. Yeah, yeah, since, right. since my first impression is that uh, you you might lose the, the, this property which you have, let's say for Douglas Ross and many other schemes, but no, you have it. Like the, the rate for the fixed point residual, yeah, is there. Okay. Yeah. The, the thing that you do lose though compared to Douglas Ratchford is that uh, in if you were to look at this lambda for Douglas Ratchford, this red term mm -hmm. is the same as the second term, and so you can pretend the red term is not there, and you get a two instead of okay. a one. Yes. in that fraction. And so you can take gamma up to two, so between zero and two. So that's where you lose a little bit when you go from Douglas Ratchford, the two operator to the, the three operator thing. But it, yeah, qualitatively, it's still, it's still average, so. Okay, and last question from my side, from in particular from for our young colleagues who, who are working on, on, the, on this topic. So uh, do you have an idea how to address from the same perspective uh, yeah, the, the sum of, yeah, let's say N operators, which are maximally monotone, and a f another one which is co coercive, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I do have some ideas. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah, hopefully I can share them soon. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so this, so this is a topic of interest. I understand. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so. If there are no other questions, then uh, I propose to stop here. So Matt, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So we also had a great discussion. So we will uh, post the slides and the video on our website. And I also like to announce that uh, our next speaker will be Ting K. Pong from uh, Hong Kong next Monday, same time. So thank you very much, Matt. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. See you soon, hopefully in, in person in Europe. Or yeah, thanks very much, Heather, and thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.